Hey everybody, welcome back to Planet Coaster. Man, it feels good to finally say those words again after almost two years of almost not playing this game, definitely not making any videos about it, and don't worry, I'm not going to dwell too much on the reason for this long hiatus, and also don't worry, it's nothing horrible and I'm doing fine. Um, there just have been many smaller reasons that all stack together into me not playing Planet Coaster very much, or video games in general. And I'll go into that later in the video, but first, I just want to talk about this coaster that I'm building, um, because it's part of the reason that I also got back into the game is because I just had an idea that was itching somewhere at the back of my head, and I really wanted to give this thing a good try and do something with it, because for the longest time I've been trying to come up with something that is well, completely new, that I haven't tried to build myself before, but I also haven't seen anybody else build. And, of course, obviously, I'm somewhat in touch with most of the Planet Coast community, and I watch many YouTube videos, uh, even when I'm not playing the game. Um, but, you know, I might not know everything that everybody's doing, so maybe some people have had this idea before me, and I'm just unaware of it. But I had this idea that I really wanted to give a try and um, I was really inspired to work on and it just tends to be that that's usually, for me at least, the best motivation to get into the game and put lots of hours in and also get a little bit addicted to see your ideas become reality because it's just so cool to try and translate your fantasies into the game and just the, the feeling that that gives whenever it works out somehow that's, that's, I think, a huge reason why I love playing this game. But I keep going very off-topic in tangents. So, I had this idea that I really wanted to try out, and it's to do something serious with the SNS Free Fly coaster. Because I think it's a, a super underutilized coaster, not just in the game, but in real life as well. There's only one of these in real life, it's called Tranon, and it's in a Swedish park called Skara Sommerland. It's not a very big park, it's not super close to a very big city in Sweden either, it's kind of out there, um, but I've had the pleasure to go there on a road trip a few years ago, and that coaster really took me by surprise, honestly, um, because this coaster type is designed as a family coaster. It's quite gentle, it doesn't do huge scary maneuvers, doesn't reach very high speeds, definitely no high g-forces or anything. But it's a really unique ride experience, uh, all thanks to that vehicle which you see. You've got the bird sitting on top of the track, and then you've got the wings uh, holding some... <laughs> I don't even know what to call them. Some things that you sit inside in rows of four people. And you're... I say rows, but it's more like a column because you're sitting behind and in front of each other, not next to each other. Um, so you're all sitting in a line there. And it's one of the most free feeling coasters that I've ever been on. I don't know how else to describe it, but you've got nothing to the left of you, you've got, no you've got nothing to the right of you, you can wave your arms in the air while you're soaring through the sky, and um, I think one of the the scariest things about it is that it's v you're very out in the open. Uh, the vehicles that you're sitting in are not very large, they're quite small, they're very low, they only come up just above your knees, you've got a small lap bar, on your lap, obviously, uh, but that aside, you're kind of just flying, and it almost feels like you're prone to flying out of that carriage whenever you sit in these things. So maybe that's just me being scaredy pants, but I thought these things were more scary than I anticipated beforehand. And I was riding this like, man, this is a family ride. This is actually quite exhilarating for a family ride. So. I think these things are very underrated in real life, but also in Planet Coaster, hardly anybody builds these things. And in real life, I know the reasons why these things tend to not get built, and I think the biggest reason is capacity. Uh, these things have a very low capacity, sitting only, um, or, or seating only 8 people per carriage. And, you know, these are not coasters that you can make long trains out of. Um, it's got a layout that makes it more difficult than, let's say, wild mouse coasters to incorporate lots of block break sections in it. So, you know, upping the capacity with lots of block sections is also going to be difficult. And on top of that, I think you just don't have the economies of scale with this kind of coaster. It's a very rare coaster, which means 
uh, getting the parts is probably difficult. It's um, it's a huge innovation, but that also means it's probably an investment risk to any parks looking to buy these kinds of things. So I understand why this thing um, never became very popular in real life, but I don't think that has anything to do with the ride experience because the ride experience is amazing, at least in my personal view, and you know, taking into consideration that it's a family coaster. This thing is not anywhere near my top 10 favorite coasters in the world, but it is one of the coasters that really positively surprised me when I rode it uh, in terms of how fun it was. And in Planet Coaster, I don't know, capacity is not the issue, but I think it might just be that these coasters are rare, that most people don't know exactly what to do with it, and it's very hard to fit into a park. It's very hard to give this thing a theming, uh, it's hard to come up with creative layouts that do something new other than just twists and turns and some inline twists here and there. Um, so they tend to not be the most interesting coasters to build either, even though their real life experience is very interesting. Now, to all of these problems, I think I, uh, I have some solutions. First and foremost, um, the capacity. This might sound really stupid, but you know how in Fantasialand you have Winges, Fear and Force. Both are spinning coasters with not a very high capacity, but you've got two of them. And having a dueling coaster kind of doubles the capacity of the coaster. And obviously some people are going to rewrite both sides, but... That's all just more people that are going to stand in line and actually, you know, up the actual capacity of the coaster. So, basically, I think that's a decent trick to use. And for this coaster, I went ahead and did some calculations. So let's say you need 13 to 15 seconds, approximately, to load people into the train and load people out of the train at the station. Um, assuming that you have a separate loading and unloading station. That means that in the game, you can dispatch trains every 22 to 25 seconds, which means 140 to 160 dispatches an hour, let's say approximately 150, which would mean 1200 hourly capacity per side. And for comparison, Tranon in Skara Summerland gets 900 people per hour at maximum, uh, but that doesn't have a separate loading and unloading station, and that's in a small local Swedish park. Um, I'd like to think that big chains like Disney and Universal would be able to come up with a more efficient loading-unloading system in a station. Now altogether, combining the two halves of this coaster, we get 2,400 guests per hour that can ride this ride. Which is fairly decent. If you look for instance at Crush Coaster in Disneyland Paris, that only manages to, uh, to well, ride seats 850 people per hour which is uh, very few. It's also too few for the park, you can definitely tell by the queue. But this ride is comparatively doing much better. So um, that's, that's definitely part of the reason. And secondly, when you're dueling these coasters, you can do so many more interesting maneuvers and things that you can't do with any other kind of dueling coaster. And this is something that you'll see come into play later on. Um, but, for instance, you just told me built that element where the, the two tracks are kind of back-to-back. -back. You've got one track that is right side up and one track that is upside down, and they kind of do that twist together, it's a little bit like a zero-g roll. That's something you can never ever do with any other type of coaster. Maybe with a, a 4D coaster or something of that sort. But even then, the interaction that you have with the other trains, as you see people, you know, flying, twisting along with you, either uh, below you or above you, that's a kind of interaction that you cannot get on any other type of dueling coaster. And I think it's uh, part of the reason why I really wanted to give this coaster a try, to just come up with a whole new coaster experience that doesn't exist anywhere else in life. And maybe this is also what kept me really motivated to work on this project. Because for me at least, there is nothing more fun than trying to come up with a completely new concept and seeing how you can make it work and at every turn when you're working on different parts of the coaster you start seeing these new options and things that you've never seen on a coaster before and that's really fun and um, it might not be the most realistic or uh, well money making way to go around building coasters but this is a video game why should i be too critical of that um, so that's the the whole appeal of this ride for now, I've worked on the start of the layout, but I'm going to finish the layout, um, the other sections at least, in other episodes, because I am trying 
to come up with this layout along with the theme and theming the layout also based on how I want these two parts of the coaster experience to work together. So for the layout that I've built so far, I also have ideas for how it's going to be themed and how I'm going to build the areas around it. So without further ado, let's get into that part of the video and see how we're going to dress this thing up. So as you might be able to tell from the title of this video, this coaster is going to receive an Arabian theming. Specifically, but I will go into this a little bit later, I'm going for a Persian inspired theme. There are many types of Arabian and Islamic architecture, uh, be it the ancient, well it's not ancient, but the old Mamluk Egyptian architecture or Moorish or Mughal architecture from uh, the areas around modern day India. These are all slightly different styles with their own interesting touches and flourishes I think. Um, but for this coaster specifically, I'm going for a Persian inspired theme and making that a little bit more broad. Um, we could definitely think about Persia as it has been uh, a long time ago when its borders were somewhat larger than nowadays. Anyway, I think uh, architecture and culture in general tends to not follow state borders very specifically. So when I say Persian, I'm already going to say that I'm not an expert on these kinds of things. I just mean the general aesthetic of that area, which comes down to um, some specific touches that you'll see later on, but definitely onion domes that are um, decorated in lavish mosaic tiles, uh, wind catchers, which are a very particular part of Persian architecture that you find in modern day Iran, but also United Arab Emirates and other parts of the Middle East. Things like that, which are uh, going to come into play here. And I might save the other Islamic architecture uh, styles for other parts of this little park here. But that's something I'm going to go into later. Anyway, the title of this chapter is uh, somewhat inspired by the Caliph Stork. And I should give you a quick warning that I'm going to talk about fairy tales for the next few minutes. Uh, not what I'm actually building in Planet Coaster, but trust me, this is going to be very relevant to this coaster. So, for a while I had decided on the coaster that I wanted to build here, and I had decided on the theme. And the theme as well is something that I just wanted to try. I've hardly ever done any Arabian inspired builds in Planet Coaster, and you don't see too many of them either in general. And I think this has something to do with the fact that there are very few Arabian pieces in the game. There are some Moorish inspired elements, I believe they're from the vintage pack. Um, but, you know, they're not, they are a little bit Orientalist, I would say. They're kind of the Western carnival inspired idea of what Moorish architecture would be. And while they can help somewhat with Arabian architecture in general, I think when you really want to get down into the nitty gritty and try to distinguish between different flavors. Um, it's it's not going to be quite enough to, to work on that. So you have to make all of the pieces yourself is what it boils down to. So this is going to be a very time consuming venture, but it's also something I really wanted to try because it's something new, you know. I've done enough Alpine and Japanese themes and it's really fun to explore new things. Anyway, so this has an Arabian theme. I'd already settled on that. And this is a dueling SNS free fly coaster. And for hours, I've been looking for a name and a theme of this coaster, and I was coming up empty until a friend of mine suggested the story of the Caliph Stork. Now, this is a story that I don't know by heart very well, but I'm gonna try and uh, tell it without spoiling the ending, by the way. So if you're really interested in old fairy tales, you can look this up yourself. But the Caliph Stork is a story about a caliph, a ruler of a caliphate in... Um, well, what is nowadays Baghdad, but was probably imagined somewhat during the uh, Abbasid era or the golden age of Islam when Baghdad was the biggest city in the world and a huge center for science and art and all of that good stuff. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I'm already getting sidetracked from telling this story. So we have this caliph, we have this ruler of this area and his, um, what's it called again? Vizier, which is a sort of assistant to the ruler of the caliph and he and this guy have this magician guy who <laughs> this is this is this is the worst telling of a fairy tale ever but a magician tricked them into uh, using a magic spell to turn themselves into storks and the story goes that there's a magic word that they can use 
to turn themselves back into humans. But if at any point during their stork experience, they laugh, they forget the magic word and they are forever stuck being storks. So what happens, of course, these dorks, they turn themselves into storks and then something makes them laugh and they forget the magic word. And turns out that it's all been a ruse by the magician to get rid of the old ruler and uh, take over his land. Um, so now these two storks are very sad and flying through the land that they used to rule looking for a way to turn back into humans and uh, save their land from this this evil so that's the story of the flying storks and it just perfectly manages to fit into this persian arabian theme that i wanted to go for in this ride and not just that the birds that you see on the free fly coaster well i think they're supposed to be crane birds because that's what tranon in skara summerland has but to be very honest, I think they kind of look like storks as well. They're somewhere in between a crane and a stork, it feels like. So for me, at least, I can suspend this belief and recognize these birds as being storks, or at the very, li at the very least, very stork-like. So I think that fits perfectly into the theme. And um, it also gives me a very good excuse to do some really interesting scenery interactions between the coaster and, well all the things that you're seeing me build here. About which, by the way, the first building that I built just on the left, on that tallest helix, is a minaret-inspired tower. <laughs> I can definitely see my kind of European castle influences here and there in the way that I'm laying out these buildings, but it is what it is. The tower is also a bit inspired by the National Garden Gate entrance uh, in uh, Tehran, in uh, Iran, which is a really cool building, which has crazy decorations on both sides of it, but on the inside, on the garden side, it has these two towers on the sides, which I think uh, work pretty well, and I pretty much made it a little bit larger and different to come up with this tower. It's still gonna receive a roof at a later date. Don't worry about it. I was procrastinating <laughs> doing that during this time because it was gonna be uh, a little bit too time consuming for my liking, and I wanted to finish the support structures first. And then over here, we have a typical wind catcher, which is something that you see very often in uh, Persia and, well, all kinds of countries in that area. Nowadays, there are some cities in Iran which are famous for having lots of these wind towers, and they are used to draw in cool air uh, and uh, throw warm air out of the buildings. And they're basically a centuries old, well, actually thousands of years old way of climate controlling uh, buildings in the desert. Um, because they can help draw in cool air because temperature swings in the desert are quite extreme so you'll have very cold nights, super hot days and these towers can help uh, very sustainably to, uh, to cool down buildings and maintain a nice a livable atmosphere. So that's that and also I think these two structures work really well to hide the support structure and this is part of uh, something that I really wanted to do with this coaster, and that is to see how I could blend the theming aspects of this coaster as much as possible with the coaster experience itself. And heck, I even think the story comes into play in, uh, in this in some sense, uh, because the story of the Caliph Stork is obviously this Caliph roaming the land that he used to rule and um, trying to find, desperately trying to find some way to... to take back his human form and I imagine this stork frantically flying through the city and all the places that he used to know from a different perspective and I think that's the kind of uh, story that this goes perfectly with. So without further ado I believe my next chapter is meant to tell a little bit more about the scenery and the ride experience combination so uh, let's get to it. So when I was at Disneyland Paris my favorite ride there is Big Thunder Mountain. Now, everybody can have their own opinions, of course. I, th I think Phantom Manor is a beautiful ride in its own right, and Space Mountain, at least the original version especially, is wonderful. But something that I really love about Big Thunder Mountain that barely any coaster ever does is its ride experience, even its trek, even its ride vehicles, they all fit into the theme and the story of the ride. It's a runaway mine train going haywire and it's just complete immersion. You know how some roller coasters, let's say for instance um, Velocicoaster, it has an amazing scenery, beautiful theming, you really 
probably because I haven't ridden Velocicoaster, but I can imagine you feel very immersed in the Jurassic World um, environment there. But something that just always irks me about coasters like this is that the coaster track and the coaster experience is kind of separate from the theming. Obviously, when you ride Velocicoaster, you're not riding an actual dinosaur, and you're aware that you're riding this steel, intimate beast, and you're in a coaster, and in your brain you can kind of shut off that fact and just enjoy the coaster for what it is, and enjoy the scenery around it for what it is as a beautiful setting. But it's not a story that you can completely move into, you know? Um, I think Baron 1898 is a really good example as well. It tells a story of miners going down into a cursed mine, and you've got the wailing the women i think it is i don't know exactly it's been a, it's been a while but um the coaster is obviously not part of that story it's used to tell the story but it's not part of it and that's something that i think is beautiful about big thunder mountain it's one of those rare coaster experiences where the ride experience itself perfectly fits the theming and it just becomes one whole that becomes more than the sum of its parts somehow. And I think there are some other coasters that do this really well too. Uh, you've got Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure at Universal Islands of Adventure, which obviously you're actually riding a motorbike. You've even got the little uh, smaller seat on the side and it really looks like Hagrid's Motorbike, which is really cool. And you've also got Tron Light Cycle Run, which in a very similar theme uh, has the setting of riding these motorbikes in Tron and it has the uh, computer simulated graphics as uh, scenery which is also one of these experiences where the ride and the theming melt into one and being at Disney riding Big Thunder Mountain just made me realize that this is something that I absolutely love and it's something that I've never been able to explore in Planet Coaster outside of obviously building Jaegerhorn where you automatically get that same bonus of being a mine train as Big Thunder Mountain has so for a while, I've been trying to come up with some kind of coaster where you can suit the ride experience to a certain theme and really try and make it blend with the uh, surrounding areas. And when it comes to the track, I think this is still not quite there. Obviously, you have to uh, imagine that the track is not there, or at least it's not part of the ride experience itself. But the vehicles that you're sitting in, the way that you fly through these buildings, all of that is uh, at least part of the story and it fits the story of the caliph stork and it fits the theming that we have around here and i think it can make for a unique ride experience that you don't have anywhere else in uh, real life at least at the moment while at the same time being heavily themed and i think this is also extra fun because i've never seen a heavily themed uh, sns free fly coaster being attempted let alone a dueling one um, so trying to do that as well is really fun and makes for some new opportunities. For example, coming up with these towers as support structures to hide the supports as much as possible. Which is nice because it makes the coaster look uh, a bit nicer. But it's also one of these ways where you can blend the technical aspects of the coaster with the uh, theming surrounding it. And I'm no structural engineer so Honestly, I don't know how realistic these support structures are, but given that some coasters do this in real life and you've got this on um, water slides as well, in fact, these support structures are very heavily uh, inspired by water slide structures, I think it's uh, plausible. And <laughs> I'm a little bit more iffy about the uh, structures that you can see to support the zero G roll there, which it's actually a light to fly element, but doesn't matter. It's a, it looks like a zero G roll because it has a really janky support in the middle of it, supporting both coasters and then some track connectors connecting the two tracks together, which is something that Gerslauer coasters do very often. But I uh, wasn't sure if it could work out with this kind of coaster. But that's why this is a game. I'm doing my best to make it as believable as possible and make sure that within uh, some, sort, some form of suspense of disbelief, uh, it's, it's probably possible. But uh, structural engineers could probably tell me a little bit more about how these uh, supports work out in general. That said, besides just trying to realistically support this coaster, I had to come up with a way to make this layout conducive to heavy theming around it as well. As you might be able to tell, 
The vehicles for the free fly coaster are huge. You've got these wide wingspans and then you've got people sitting on the sides of these wings in swinging carriages, which also means that the swing adds to the hitbox that you have for these things. And um, that's a lot of space to worry about uh, not building any scenery in. And on top of that, this is a dueling coaster. So you've got two of these massive hitboxes flying across the track and basically giving you zones where you cannot build any scenery. Um, so this is also part of the reason why I wanted to be very careful about the layouts and come up with the theming along with the layouts because I had to specifically make the layout in such a way that there was space left over uh, to do scenery. So for these first two helixes for instance, we have the coaster switching from an upright position to a upside down position after the first curve, which helps because during that first curve it obviously rotates to a 90 degree angle, which gives me extra space to fit this tower in the middle. If I kept it uh, banked to the inside like a regular coaster, there would be no space for this tower because one of the wings would smash into it, people would die and stuff, it wouldn't be very comfortable. Then, after that, the carriage is upside down, which gives me space to build a bridge over it. And after that, we move into another helix to the right, where there's more space to fit a tower, which is where I built the wind catcher. And after that, we move into a block break section, which doubles as a theming aspect that crosses over the upside down part of the first curve. But it's also just a nice bridge, some theming to add to this whole structure and make the whole thing more dense and interesting. I also think it makes for really interesting head choppers. In general, this, this ride gives opportunities for really cool head choppers because the carriages on the side with people in them are about as tall as the bird in the middle. So you can come really close to scenery, uh, even taking into consideration that the carriages are swinging. So you have to give them some extra space and uh, do some really interesting things with that. So that's the, uh, that's the idea of melting this ride experience together with the theme. And speaking of the theme, there are some things that I need to note really quickly. As I'm working on the spire of the tower here, you can see some tiles that are from a theme maker's toolkit. And this is probably worth talking about. I haven't used many theme maker's toolkit items in any of my builds in Planet Coaster so far. I've definitely used some, mostly in my ski resort videos. Um, but it's something that I've strayed away from doing too much in general. And for this build, I'm trying to use as many Theme Maker's Toolkit items as I can, whenever I can. And the reason for that is, honestly, I've been looking at the same pieces and the same textures in Planet Coaster for many years. And I really wanted to try something else, make something that looks different, make something that, to me at least, is more refreshing. And I don't think this makes it easier per se. I sometimes see people um, reasoning that using Theme Maker's Toolkit makes it easier to make good looking things or it's in some way cheating. Personally, I don't think so. I think there's a really interesting challenge to limiting the amount of pieces that you can use and definitely uh, limiting yourself to the original piece of the game without any DLCs is a really fun, cool challenge to get creative with pieces. But in the end, if you have a vision for something that you wanna build in the game, I don't think it matters too much which pieces you're using for that and if you're using extra pieces that people created for the game. Most of the Theme Maker's Toolkit pieces are small, they're quite simple, you still have to do a lot of work yourself to turn them into things that you want to do. So for instance, most of the stucco pieces that I'm using here are Theme Maker's Toolkit stucco pieces because I love the textures and I think they work really well for the theme. Some of the wood pieces that I'm using are also Theme Maker's Toolkit pieces. But those wooden pieces are just similar logs and planks to the ones that you have in game, just with a different shape or a different texture. And um, what's especially huge for this build are the decal pieces, mostly the decals made by Fuarana. Uh, Fua, if you hear this, thank you so much for these amazing pieces because they are a huge game changer and you see many people using them these days. But yeah, they're great because you can use them to give these somewhat plain, uh, simple stucco faces, some detail and some slight color changes, especially around the edges where you can add some cracks or dirty grime stains and things like that. And it's small touches like this which make builds feel a little bit more realistic, especially because real life parks 
play with their stucco textures in this way. So all things considered, I think using Theme Maker's Toolkit doesn't necessarily make the game easier. It just gives you it just gives you more options to turn your vision into a reality, with maybe some exceptions. Obviously, there will be Theme Maker's Toolkit pieces which are very large and pre-built elements. Um, but I'm really using the smaller pieces here to give myself more flexibility and uh, options to come up with a way to translate some creative vision in my head to something in the game. And I came up with this rant because the roof of the tower is made up of very small Theme Maker's Toolkit bricks, which work really well as roof shingles or as bricks if you're making a custom brick wall. And these are the kind of pieces that Otherwise, I would have just used small wooden brackets for in the game, but then I'd end up with way too many polygons and textures that don't quite suit the need. And with these smaller Theme Maker's Toolkit pieces, there's just more flexibility. So um, I think it's great, and I really enjoy playing with it. There's also another thing that I want to note while I'm working on this small minaret that's beside the lift hill, and that is that the wind catcher that I built is unfinished. I built these wind catchers and then I realized later on, wait a second, I forgot about the uh, interior of these things <laughs> because generally the way they work is that they have different holes that are separated from each other uh, that can be inlets and outlets at any time. It depends on the wind direction, so for instance if a town has a prevailing wind direction or a prevailing good wind direction where the wind isn't dusty or whatever, it will have open holes on those sides of the wind catcher, but not on the other one. Whereas if a town has uh, many directions that the wind could possibly be coming from, you've got omnidirectional wind catchers, which are the ones that I'm working on right now. They've got holes on all sides. Um, and you can let the air go in or out on uh, whatever side would be necessary, depending on uh, what the wind direction is. Only problem is, I um, managed to build these things without actually closing them on the inside. So all the wind's just going to go straight through this and not actually down into the towers. Uh, really sorry about this, guys. This is not going to be fixed for the next few episodes because I already have a bunch of stuff recorded in, um, in advance. And also, I'm not going to come back to these very soon. But just know that eventually I will go back to the wind catchers and fix these things up. For now, though... You'll just have to, uh, <laughs> you'll just have to suffer in pain uh, looking at these things anytime. I hope it's not going to be too bad. Just know that I'm here with you guys, and I'm still annoyed at my old self for um, leaving these things like this. Anyway, that's the wind catchers. I'm also going to try and make all the wind catchers slightly unique. They have a very typical design with these. Um, well, for actually, that's that's eight. Yeah, with eight pillars. Uh, which means you basically get eight holes and then they always have these logs uh, lodged into them. Um, so it's, it's a very typical look. You also have wind catches that look different. Some of them won't have planks or um, there, are some octo oct there are some octagon shaped wind catches as well. But these are the most typical ones and the ones that I figured I wanted to use for this build. And here I started working on a minaret, which <laughs> I end up throwing away at a later stage. So, sorry about that. I'm gonna try and come up with a way to bring this thing back at some point in the future. Uh, just know for now that I really love experimenting with uh, smaller scenery elements, but you can only see what the complete picture looks like once you finish that smaller scenery element. And sometimes things just kind of don't work out, which is also a bit of a shame because this minaret ended up taking a lot of time to build, uh, just like the other one, but it's, I don't know, I just really enjoy doing these things and placing lots of items on spires and seeing what kind of shapes you can possibly come up with. But I'm going to leave it at that point. This thing is going to come back at some point in the future, but um, don't want to dwell on it too much at this point. Now, I saved the least for last in this because I uh, was procrastinating on doing the backsides of these buildings because... Yeah, for the way it feels, these buildings really do have some backsides in the middle here. And this is a kind of unfortunate circumstance because of the way that these layouts are built. But in the middle here, we just have a mess of buildings that I have to finish and make look decent. But it's obviously never going to be a, um, a very big, important part of this ride. Although, that's also worth mentioning. I think whenever you're doing scenery, you have to also build scenery that you know barely anybody's going to look at and that you want to 
keep out of uh, the view most of the time or at least not draw any attention to because as humans there's no way that we can throw all our attention at an entire row of buildings or facades and have it work out very well. Uh, typically it's always good to try and come up with certain perspectives or parts of buildings that you really want to bring most of the attention to and finish the rest as a way to give context to those buildings um, but not draw the eye of people too much to it. So in this case the tower is going to be the main interest point and the layouts themselves but this is really filler and I think that's fine. But yeah, that is it for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it and are uh, just excited to uh, see how this pans out as I am. Because at this point in time, I'm still also very curious. But um, let me know what you think of it. And uh, for now, thanks for watching and hope you guys have a good day and I'll see you next time.